And we are live. Yes, we are. Happy Friday to all. Um, um, you know, it's another week that has gone by. The, you know, the weather has gotten a little bit warmer here in the Northeast. And I know I talk about it all the time with the snow, but now the snow is finally melting and, uh, and everything is, uh, you know, seems like it's going back to normal weather wise and get the kids out, man. I've been, you know, you know, I'm closed in with the kids, uh, every day. And I also got like, uh, my, I was telling John before we came, uh, on, I, I, I got my, uh, first, uh, COVID shot. So, um, the arm is, is getting sore. The shoulder is getting sore. It's working. Whatever's happening is working. I feel like a, a, a slight little fever. So I'm a little, I'm a little tired and, and hopefully I'll, uh, keep the, uh, the pace going up. John, my friend, John. Yes. How hello. Are you? How are you I'm, today? I'm well, man? man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. And, uh, what do you have on wrist tonight? I have a Seiko Black Monster, uh, first generation. It Very is nice. probably the first, like, legitimate, like, real watch that I've ever owned. Honestly, yeah. Well, yeah. not that I've ever owned, but that I bought for myself. Gotcha. And we'll we'll get back uh, into that in a little bit. I am wearing uh, my friend Peter uh, sent in uh, for me to review. It's a little hard to see the. Uh, the webcam, my new camera, I don't know, wasn't picking up uh, on the computer. But anyway, so this is the Zen 105, I have 104 with a white dial, limited edition with a red seconds hand. Great watch, John. I don't know if you're, how familiar you are with Zen. It's a German watch company. Just they watching make, some uh, of your videos. Yeah, they make uh, they make great watches. <clears throat> I'm going to chime in through the um, the chat and see what's going on. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Philly watch uh, fan, what's going on? James, how are you, sir? Blue shirt, Bruce. What's up, buddy? Um, Sanjay, how are you, my friend? Hey, Daniel, how you doing? Chris Ross, what's up? Uh, let us also know what you guys are wearing tonight. Uh, Nilo, hey, buddy, how are you? Keith, Chaz from the Berg. Um, Wasan, what's up, man? How you doing? It was nice meeting you the other night on um, in stream. Uh, Roar the Tiger, Joe C, what's up? <coughs> Wilson, how are you? Uh, a lot of people shouting out to each other, which is awesome. I love seeing that. Uh, underachieving watch collector, what's going on? Hey, Scott. Hey, Rick, how you doing, buddy? Uh, Jeff, how are you? Yes, the Red Seconds, yes. Um, pretty sweet watch, man. I, I just love that. I mean, if you're gonna get the 104, the Zen 104, the white dial is the one to get. I just, uh, I, I love it. Um, Mario wearing the Vario Empire, very nice watch. I reviewed one of those um, not too long ago. Uh, Rasan is wearing the JLC Polaris Day tonight. Very nice, very nice. Some nice watches on the chat. Mount Sander time. How are you? What's going on? Okay, so um, I asked uh, my friend John, and I've known John for, for years now, and uh, we actually met uh, through Mrs. Legs, my wife. Uh, uh, Mrs. Legs and John worked together back in the day, and Mrs. Legs and, and John and, and John's wife, you know, have been, you know, pretty good friends for, for a really long time. And then so when I, you know, came on board, uh, I got the introduction to, to John. And, um, you know, John, um, at the time, John, John's a John's a, a big dude, man. He's you know he's a big guy. He's a, he's an athlete. I mean, a, co a college athlete. And we're gonna get into that a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I trained with John for a little bit. He he he's also a fitness trainer, amongst other things. And and you'll get to know uh, John a little bit here. We'll start off talking about his uh, collection a little bit, and then we'll get into other things. Um, but uh, you know, John, I've known John for a long time, and I'm I'm very excited to have, have John on. So John, this is a watch channel, the Bobby Lake channel. Um, yes. We, we talk about watches. We do stream a lot here. Um, <laughs> you have a, a somewhat of a, of, of a, of a interest in watches, a little bit of a passion, you know, maybe admittedly you said, you know, you don't know if you're an enthusiast or collector. I think you are because, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this. Um, how did you get into watches? Like what was, what was the first thing that, that you could remember your first watch. Let, let us know a little bit about how you got into it. You know what? I could distinctively remember the first watch that I 
and and unfortunately, I think it was stolen. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's a long story, so I won't New get Jersey. it. New Jersey, hey, New Jersey. But <laughs> when I was like a child, my grandmother gave me a Mickey Mouse watch. Nice, it was very nice. White, white dial, Mickey Mouse on the dial, black like you know faux leather strap, and like I don't know. I, at that time, I thought that was the coolest thing. Yeah. But you know, when I it was much later when I was working in construction as a construction manager and just walking around the job site and just always needing like you know, a flashlight and a, a pocket knife and all this stuff. I got real nerdy into the EDC thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would visit websites like EDC forums and everything like that. And they had, you know, they have a watch forum. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just convinced myself that I needed to, to wear a watch because up until that point, I didn't wear a watch daily. I didn't, right. I don't even think I really owned a watch, maybe a couple cheap. I don't even know what I probably had an Iron Man at some point and probably lost right. it and, and so on. So I, uh, I don't know who posted it or how I got, you know, into it, but I, I saw the Seiko and it was relatively affordable compared to the other watches. It wasn't a cheap, like sub $100 watch. It looked like a legitimate diver's watch. I just, I just, I liked the look. It was big, bulky, masculine, had the loom, stainless steel, but with the rubber strap. Yeah. I know. I just, uh, I thought it was the coolest thing. So, you know, I guess at the time that was, this is probably like 10 years ago or so, you know, ponied up like the 300 bucks and, and bought it. So, so and, we're talking uh, about, um, yeah, the, the one on the left, the, the, the monster right here. Yep. So, so first gen monster, first gen monster. Yeah, I mean these these watches are are just um, a, really a fan favorite. There's like a cult following. Uh, That's with, it's cool to hear. Yeah, I um, love it. And then work, walking around the construction site too. I have I have smacked this watch against concrete walls. I've done it's yeah. like I don't. It doesn't even have a scratch on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean that shroud oh, oh, does a, a really good job of uh, protecting some some of the watch as well. Um, so yeah, so so you so you got the monster. It's your it's your first watch. Did you did you jump into you know? I, I grew up in the eighties. We grew up at the same time. We're, we're about the same age. Mm -hmm. um, I got heavy into like Casio and Swatch. That didn't even uh, appeal to you at, at at a young age, or no? I mean, I'm sure at some point yeah. when I was younger, I probably had like the calculator watch, right, right, right. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, gotcha. things like that. Um, and then. Uh, at some point, I also had a pretty nice black G-Shock that was yeah. also stolen. Somebody yeah. broke into our home and stole like my jewelry box, basically. So I had a bunch of watches in there, and 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 you know nothing expensive, but yeah, all that's gone. Um, yeah, uh, James and Santa Sega Monster are pretty watch with some great colorways. You know, I had that experience too, like you know, with somebody breaking into. So I lived in um, in North Jersey, and in Hudson County, and. Um, you know, I mean, it's a city. I mean, it's it's very city. I mean, like we're literally across the river from Manhattan. I don't know why I say that. I'm just setting up the scene. But uh, <laughs> my my father had passed away, and he um he had this boulevard, right? Um, and it wasn't it wasn't that fancy. It was a little stainless steel watch, and um and my mom was saving that, you know, to give me one day. And I remember like looking forward to that day, you know. And somebody um. Uh, somebody came in and or somebody just you know ripped off ripped us off somebody like you know broke into our place stole uh stole a couple of things stole a camcorder we had one of those like big camcorders this is like late 80s early 90s right i don't think i was in college yet and um i had this jackson uh flying v not jackson i'm sorry kramer flying v guitar right red my first serious electric guitar and you can tell like i knew something was up I knew that something was up um, when I walked into the house and I walked into my bedroom and the guitar wasn't where I had put it. It was laying on the floor. And I'm like, wait, oh. that, I would never do that. Your heart sinks. And my heart sinks. Yeah. And then like, I, I, I told my mom, I was like, I think I must've been like, oh man, I must've been like 16 or 17 years old. And I told my mom, I think somebody was in the house. You know what I mean? And sure oh. enough, the camcorder, my mom had bought this camcorder for my aunt's wedding that um and and at the time it was a lot of money and yeah. then uh and then the jewelry box and the thing that was taken was my dad's watch and and for the life of me i've been trying to remember what that watch looks like um wow. i kind of sort of think i know what it looks like so i go on chrono 24 and i go and look at old globus but I, nothing is ringing ringing a bell and i wish 
I wish I can get that watch somehow. Yeah. But, um, you know, it is, it is what it is, man. Yeah. Um, hey, Thomas, how are you? How you doing? Nefarian, what's up? Uh, got the typical, got the, got the crew here today. I'm uh, excited. Thank you guys for, for coming in. Um, so Rick is like, I'm extremely, uh, tremendously late uh, to the party. And he got his uh, first G-Shock today. Nice. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, Keithy, for some reason, when I use the YouTube, app, okay. Uh, so, all right. That's, uh, I think he's, uh, Keith is chatting. Um, <coughs> oil money, I pity the fool who tries to break <laughs> into my watch safe. Forget about the dog, beware. Of, uh, forget about the dog, beware of owner. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, Anyway, so so I I feel for you um, when somebody breaks into I feel for anybody that, that happens. So so I apologize. <laughs> I know I went on the tangent there, um, but so so go on. So please uh, so um, so you get the Seiko, you get the the monster. You start picking and, up other watches or yeah what, what yeah. So I mean I got into the holy DC thing and collecting yeah. knives and doing all that stuff, and then. Um, I don't know whether it was uh, just at that time or maybe it's still super popular today, but for some reason I felt like Invicta was a very popular choice for an inexpensive watch yeah. at the time. Yeah. And I started, uh, and I always was attracted to the Submariner and it seemed like Invicta got a lot of positive reviews for being a, uh, a, a fairly good homage to a Rolex Submariner. Mm -hmm. So of course I, I, bought an Invicta and that turned in and I had one in black, then I had one in, yeah. in blue, then I had uh, the gold, you know, and uh, you know, I, I wanted the Grand Diver because it was bigger than the uh, the Pro Diver. And right. um, yeah, at one point I probably had like five or six, five or six uh, Invictas. And uh, they were all the big Grand Diver style. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in retrospect, you know, I probably should have just saved my money and bought a, a nicer, <laughs> one nicer watch. Because right. ultimately, I didn't really like the, I didn't really fall in love with the Invictas because they had the big Invicta logo carved in this in sure. the case, and uh, you know, big Invicta logo carved in the in the bracelet, and right. um, but you know, it was cool for what it was. You know, sure, so you, I've whittled down that collection to the picture that I sent you. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, look, I mean, like, there's always, you know, I think when we start collecting, especially with me, um, you know, we, we start picking up watches. Um, you know, we because we like them and and some stay, you know, some in, in the affordable range because, um, you know, we can afford them. Right. You know, when when I started collecting watches. Right. And I was buying a couple hundred dollar watches. The whole idea, the thought of spending a thousand dollars on a watch was just so foreign to me. I was like, how could I ever do that? Right. Mm -hmm. Until you do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then and then you you say to yourself, well, I can't spend three or four on a on a watch, and then you do it. Right, um, so it becomes as a collector, uh, from my experience, value gets a little warped. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, price tag gets a little warped. Um, but I had the same experience as you did. I was buying some of these uh, watches, and um, and I was thinking to myself, man, I mean, I probably. I mean, I wanted X, but I got all these other ones because it reminded me of X. And I might as well have saved my money um, to get the yep. watch that I wanted to get. But the problem is, is I would have never figured that out until I went through it. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent, I guess we always find a justification to spend money on the things that we most enjoy. So I've spent a lot of money on you know, various types of exercise equipment, things that other people wouldn't appreciate, but I found value in spending the money on it. But mm -hmm. I'm at that point too, where it's like, you know, I just, I can't, I can't just feel selfish and irresponsible from by spending too much money on a watch right now. You know, like that's right. kind of where I'm at. Like, I would love to, I would love, I would love to, you know, even just spend a thousand dollars or $2,000 on something that's really sharp. You know, I would buy, um, well, uh, we could talk offline about a, a like a pre-owned Rolex, but yeah. um, but I would love to do that. But I just feel like oh, I just can't quite get myself to do that yet. It just seems like eh, I'm not I'm not there yet. Like there's there's better things to spend my money on. So, no, absolutely. And 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 I zoomed, I zoomed in here because you had this uh, Pagani in here, and that looks a lot like 
a Rolex that uh, maybe that you're uh, alluding to that you want to, you know, maybe purchase one day. And this, uh, this has a definitely a, a date just uh, vibe to it. So are, are you, is a date just something that down the road, if it's feasible, something that you would be uh, interested in? Yes. So I am, it used to be the uh, Submariner, but I just right. feel like the Submariner homages, there's just so many of them out there now. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of homages in, in every style, but that just seems to be like so overdone at this point. But, uh, and then plus I'm a little bit older and I feel like, you know, something a little bit more like uh, a little bit classier, a little bit more mature. So a uh, date just, or even just an oyster perpetual, because honestly, as I'm getting older, I'm wearing glasses right now. I can't even, I couldn't see the date anyway. <laughs> I don't need the, I don't need the date function, you know, yeah. but just a nice, I love that dial. I love the fluted bezel. Yeah. I love the Jubilee bracelet. Yeah. If I could get the fluted, the fluted uh, bezel and the Jubilee bracelet on a Oyster Perpetual with a blue, blue dial, just like that. I'd like, that would, you know, I would consider pulling the trigger if I found something affordable. Yeah. 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 Down, you know, a little bit down the road. A little bit down the road, sure, sure. And then, and then here to to wrap up your your current collection. You, like you said, you downsized it. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, you have the Orient uh, a Bambino? Is that um, is that a forty millimeter? Do you recall, or is that thirty eight millimeter? I, you know what? It, I think it's a little bit larger. It must. Uh, I think so. Yeah. I I actually just bought that. Because, yeah. uh, you know, getting sucked into because your channel and getting sucked into watching your watch videos and then getting sucked into watching other watch videos, you go down yeah. the rabbit hole. And, uh, you know, one of the popular videos is like a three a three watch collection. Yeah. And I like to simplify things. So that yeah. way I know, like, I'm prepared if I I have my everyday watch. I have a sports watch. I have, uh, you know, a dress watch that I mean, when am I going to wear a dress watch once in every great while. Right. So it seemed like that for an inexpensive dress watch that seemed to have a lot of positive reviews. It was a res it was respected. And I like the fact that all three watches are automatics. You yeah. know, they're not quartz watches. Um, so I feel like I'm good for now. Like yeah. that, that covers the bases in the watch yeah. category. For sure. Yeah. I mean, Kevin May is making it against the Tudor Black Bay, uh, Tudor. Um, the, I'm, I have a Black Bay 58. Um, yes which is a 39 millimeter, but the regular Black Bay um, divers are, are 41 millimeters and they're, and they're great, great watches. Um, you know, um, pound for pound, maybe uh, as good or better than a Submariner, depending on who you ask. Um, so so moving moving away a little bit uh, from watches and, and I want to, and, and I wanted to share like, you know, a couple of things in your life uh, with, with people here um, in, in the chat, because I also find that, you know, some of the, some of the things that you've done have been kind of inspirational in, in a sense uh, to me. Um, you know, I've hinted that I met John through Mrs. Legs and that, that I trained with him. So, so John, you know, um, John, you were a college athlete, right? I mean, you were a high school athlete, college athlete, very, very athletic, very successful athlete. Can you can you tell us a little bit of, of, about that, uh, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, I I played, you know, like most athletes, I played football in high school. I, I threw shot put and discus in high school. Um, and I guess that's where I was more successful, throwing shot put and discus. And successful, like, on a regional level, not, yeah. not necessarily on a national level. But, I mean, although I did attend nationals um, and earned a scholarship to, you know, a division one school and was regionally successful there until I was injured. And, but, you know, working out was always a part of my life. Training was always a part of my life, you know, trying to learn about nutrition and, and all that stuff was always a part of my life. So um, that's how I got started with all that. Yeah. You know, and guys in the chat, if you have any questions about John in regards to training nutrition, please, you know, throw that in there. Um, uh, I'm sure we, we'd, we'd like to get into that as well before we get yeah. into other things. And, um, but you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're being a little modest. I mean, like, you know, weren't you all state in, 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 uh, in high school? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was, uh, all state in football. I was, uh, Eastern States champion in shot put. 
and uh, yeah, but you know, you know, I'm an adult now, so when I look back, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I, I get it, I get it, I get it. But there's not, but there's not, you know, like if you're all state in football, right? I mean, there's not too many people I know who's been all state in anything. You know what I mean? Like that's that that to me that to me is very very impressive. Um, anyway, so you so you get out of college, you start you start working in, in the real world, right? Um, you could call it that. Right, I, right. I had several lost years there where I was a little, uh, you know, my party years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we all. <laughs> I think we, I think we can relate to that. And so, and so you got into uh, construction management, right? Mm -hmm. But fitness was still um, part of your of your life. Now, now, what I find interesting is that you got into like different kinds of things. So you, mm -hmm. you got into a little bit of the uh, strongman stuff, didn't you? Um, yeah, like training with strongman stuff. I got real like nerdy with grip training for a while. Oh so, yeah, like, please bend, talk about this. Bending this. steel, closing grippers, you know, uh, picking up, you know, you're not, like, maybe the guys watching are not going to understand the terminology, but picking up block weights and blobs, like you cut the head off of a hex dumbbell and that would be called a block weight. So that's one way to strengthen like the entirety of your hand, like a wide pinch. And then you could go down the rabbit hole with that, like buying revolving handles and buying like pinch devices, two hand pinch devices and all kinds of ways to train grippers with extended handles and choking them. So you're closing them from a limited range of motion and you, you could uh, rate all the different grippers. So you could make like logical incremental increases in, in uh, difficulty as you go up. I mean, it's, it's never, it's like watches. You just, you're, it's becomes an entirely different world in an entirely different language. It's uh, so I got real crazy into that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kevin's got a question. I don't know. Do you want to answer that? Uh, where did you go to college? Uh, went to Rutgers, Rutgers yeah. university. New so, Jersey. so, so both John and I uh, went to Rutgers. Uh, I don't believe our, I don't think our paths ever crossed though. Who knows many a drunk night. Um, uh, <laughs> Possible, possible. Technically, I went to Cook College. Right, right. I went to a couple of Ag Field days. So uh, Ag, oh my God, they were the best. <laughs> yeah, they which was like best. a big party weekend on Cook College campus, uh, like in the spring, right? And oh it was just my like, God, it was awesome. People would drag their furniture out of their apartments, and it would just yeah. be it would be mayhem. Now, like they they toned it down. Like even while I was there, they they toned it down a lot. But oh my God, when I first got this, it was incredible. It's yeah. just a campus wide like mayhem. It was great. Yeah. Uh, yes, the climbers do have crazy grip strength. And Absolutely. so and so do deadlifters, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, you know. Yeah, they have to. So so you so you do you get really geeky on the strongman and especially the the grip training. Um, mm -hmm. When do you make that leap um, to kind of like say goodbye to your nine to five, right? And um, and then you start having fitness as your your main main career. Wow. So I I guess it just happened like progressively over the years where I felt like I had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish uh, career wise, salary wise, like as a construction project manager. It was never like a dream to become a construction project manager, but it was an opportunity that I had to get involved in like the construction business. And then I ended up working where, you know, st where I met Steph and I made, like, I wanted to be out in the field and I wanted to run jobs. And then once I got to that point, I was like, all right, well, what's the next step? Because I don't, I, I feel like this is the end of the road for me in construction. I don't want to work longer hours and put up with more politics. I just want to like do the next thing. And, and I guess the next thing for me at that point was, I felt like I needed to challenge myself to to work for myself and to be more of a an entrepreneur, or at least self-employed, you know, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, you know, I just consumed videos about like warehouse gyms and opening up your own gym and and you know what you would need to do and um, you know and so. I just became progressively more fed up with the politics at my job until one day I, 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 I slipped up and basically told the owner, like, I, I just don't want to, do, like, he pressured me. I was like, I just don't really don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I'm like, we, we work in like terrible neighborhoods. 
the terrible contractors and like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Anyway, at the end of that round of projects that I was managing, he let me go. And yeah. that's kind of what I needed to happen in order for me to take the next step. And I think, you know, in a way I kind of knew it. And I, I think that's why I was so honest with him because I was almost hoping to get fired. Gotcha. <laughs> so. uh, what happened to Christian? He's back and he's recruiting the hell out of it. You know, um, yeah, he's getting some top recruits, man. You know, he's that, that, that was always his strength anyway. Um, you know, hopefully he's got some really good coaches in his staff surrounding him too. Um, but uh, no, he's, he's back. And we're very, very happy as as Rutgers alum. Um, Kevin says, yeah, Sago Tuna would be a good man. Uh, watch for a strong man. <laughs> so absolutely agree. Um, so so fast forward and um, uh, you end up opening up your own, you know, studio like gym, right? I mean, uh, a couple years ago. Yeah. So it's in April. It will actually be three years that I opened up uh, Metabolic Functional Fitness in Hamilton, New Jersey. So it's a small group training, personal training, nutrition coaching. Um, yeah, so that's it's been my life for the past three years. And so I've been so busy working from home. It's been easy to intermittent fast. I look up at the end of the day and I realize I haven't eaten. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, when you're working from home, I mean, it definitely – it definitely can help. Um, I know I have control, full control of every, any time, every, anything I eat because, you know, the kitchen is literally the next room over. And, and John, you've done some, you've, you've played around with intermittent fasting and keto and all those kind of things, right? I mean, yeah, I've done, I've tried like every style of eating imaginable. And I think I just, uh, I've, I've eventually just came back to the fact that, you know, you could eat flexibly. It really just, it really is all about energy balance. Yeah. Calories in versus calories out. When you're talking about your body weight, and then if you're talking about strength and body composition and all that, well, then you have to pay attention to other things, obviously. But for like the average Joe or Jane who's just looking to lose weight, the number one thing they have to focus on is, is their calorie intake. That, that's it. That's really it. If you just yeah. like manage for calories, you're good to go. And is that like, is that like 90% of the game and like 10% is like fitness or? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I, I used to know this off the top of my head and be able to rattle it off, but yeah, it's a, it's calories is number one. And then macronutrients, just meaning like you're getting enough protein to, uh, to recover from your workouts. And then you want to make sure that you're getting enough healthy fats and then carbohydrates come last. Yeah. And, and that's it. And yeah. that's it. So. Yeah, you know, I, I've um, the last. So I never, I never, I've, I've trained, right? Um, but I've never had a plan until like I met you, and then um, you know, it things started to change, and, and I started noticing more results because well, you were keeping a plan for me when we were training, right? You had a spreadsheet, and you were you were telling me what to do when we were working out. So like, I I never writ, wrote things down before. Right. And so then I moved away, you moved away, and I started working out on my own. But you, you had set me up with a great system of, um, you know, of, of just keeping a record of, of, of what you're doing. Um, because I was winging it every time I worked out. And I, know, I never thought, like, you know, well, why am I not getting the results I wanted to get, you know? And, uh, and because, like, I didn't know what I was lifting the day before, you know? Right. I, mean, I totally, totally forget, you know? Yeah. Um, so... Um, but the, I got to tell you, the, the last like six months, I mean, I haven't picked up a weight. And uh, no. Know, I, yeah. I mean, and it's because, you know, no. my son started coming into our bedroom every night in the middle um, of the night. No sleep. And the sleep thing has been killing me. What I have been doing the last, you know, few months, uh, three or four months is like three times a week. I'm on I'm on the, the Peloton. Right. Mm -hmm. So at least I'm doing that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's able to, that's in the bedroom. That's no excuse. I mean, I could just go on it as, you know, the barn is 200 feet away where my <laughs> equipment is. And now with all this snow, oh, it's such a yeah. marathon to get it. You know what I mean? Weren't you, uh, uh, didn't you have a lot of back pain? Weren't you experiencing a lot of back pain at one yeah, point? Yeah, but that, that was all gone, man. I started doing okay. deadlifts right. And, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and my back was fine. Like, you know, I mean, I don't have back issues anymore. 
good. good. You know, I was doing so many deadlifts, um, you know, like at least like twice a week. And then it caught out to that's me. That's a lot. Like, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, then it caught out to me. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, one time a week. And then when I was noticing, John, I was like, at the, you know, like in, I'm, I'm, I'm 47, I'm pulling about 430 pounds. That's awesome. Um, by that doing awesome. less deadlifts. Yeah. Yeah. Deadlifts are extremely taxing. They're extra, they're more taxing than squats. You know, the more they're, they're taxing on your central nervous system. They require the most amount of recovery. So, yeah. And then as we get older, we need more recovery on top of that. So deadlifting once a week, even some, some people deadlift like every other week. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When I get sure. back into it and hopefully that'll be next month, um, because my son doesn't come into our room as much anymore. Uh, so I am getting a decent amount of sleep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to get back into a routine and I'm probably just going to deadlift once a week yeah, uh, to start and maybe, maybe do less. Um, but I seem to get stronger. Look, I mean, there's a point of like, uh, uh, I mean, like I can't do minimal, I can't do like three deadlifts a month and expect to get stronger. I get that. So I had to find the right, you know, yeah. amount, you know, <laughs> yeah, me. absolutely. The um, optimum recoverable volume. Yeah, exactly. So Kevin is saying, how are you making it through the pandemic? Many fitnesses didn't survive, which is a shame. Um, yeah, so we were. What's you know, going on with you with that? So we were, we were in fact closed for six months, but I, you know, I did continue to personal train people at the gym. Uh, so yeah. I pulled the shades down. I blocked out the front door. Had people park in a an adjacent parking lot, and they came in through the back door, and I continued to train my clients that way. And uh, now that we're back open. You know, clients are slow. Members are slowly coming back. But, you know, six months is a long time. Like people's lives change. People's yeah. priorities change. People are working from home. People's kids aren't going to school. So they can no longer come to the gym at the times that they were coming because now they're responsible for their kids. And and uh, yeah, a lot of things working against you. So, you know, slowly but surely getting back on our feet. Yeah. Um, Joe, uh, Joe has a good question. John, what home dumbbell exercise do you recommend the most? Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's not even so much exercise specific. It's, 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 you could break it down into movements, right? So there's, uh, only so many gross movement patterns that we have squatting, bending, pushing, pulling, twisting, lunging, and then walking, carrying, you know, running what you would consider gait. So uh, just loading those basic movement patterns with any type of weight, you know, like that's, that's one of the things that attracted me to fitness to begin with is that there's, there's such a low barrier of entry. You don't need a big fancy barbell set. You don't need like adjustable dumbbells from obviously all those things make it easier, but uh, you know, just working on those basic gross movement patterns and loading it any way you can and being consistent, and you're going to see progress over time. So, yeah. So, so example, you know, body squats. You can just yeah. do. You can start doing body squats, and then, yeah. you know, holding a, a two year old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do you doing can, body squats. You know. Yeah, I mean? I mean, you could go barbarian style, man. You put on some gardening gloves and go run into the woods, and you could be you could be lifting logs, yeah. lifting heavy stones, doing push ups, doing handstand push ups. Find a place to do pull ups. Find a place to do squats. You know, heavy carries. All you know, those those are. It doesn't cost any money. Anybody could do it. And you know, obviously there's a point if you want to become a competitive power lifter or a professional bodybuilder or, a, or an extremely successful athlete, like, yeah, obviously you need a, a proper weight room and a, and a proper program. But uh, if you're just trying to carve out like, you know, 30 minutes a day, three days a week, just to kind of make some progress. Yeah. You don't, you don't need any real special equipment. It, it really comes down to willpower, hard work, consistency, and the discipline to get it done. Yeah. You know, I find, you know, the, the, the Peloton is great. Um, and there's different types of classes you could take different kinds of exercises, you know, uh, hit exercises, you know, long, steady uh, rides. But the one exercise that I've done in the last few months that really kicks my ass, especially in the beginning was chopping wood. 
Yeah. Chopping wood was, I was out of breath after like 10 minutes, man. And I'm soaked. Yeah. That's then I got a little bit better at it. The more and more I did it, you know, yeah. I could go out there for a half an hour and chop wood and, and be fine. I, event, I got to that point. Nice. That's um, good cardio. Yeah. Good, good cardio, uh, good shoulder work, back work. You know, I, I, I appreciate, oh. I, so I love, I love the gym stuff. I love getting my back on a bench and just, and just pushing, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing bench for example, which is maybe not a, um, typical movement that we do on a daily basis, but I appreciate the more, um, um, what, what's it called? Uh, functional training, right. Aspect, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, the, the, the body squats, the, the running up and down stairs, um, the stuff that I have to do on a daily basis with kids. Right, you know what right. I mean? That's functional, right? Yeah. If I can yeah. get stronger doing that, then I think I'm ahead of the game there. You know, yeah. um, Chaz is eating pizza during the live stream. Chaz, I eat pizza like once or twice a week. Don't be ashamed. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, wrist rest. <laughs> Wear that Panerai more often when you miss your deadlift days. Actually, the the Panerai is it's titanium, so it's it's not that uh, that that heavy. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, lift uh, two Invicta pros ten times. <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, are kettlebells preferable to dumbbells? I guess it depends on what you're doing or what exercise you're doing, right, John? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was never a big kettlebell fan, so kettlebells are great. I think they're great for a conditioning tool. I think they're a great tool to teach people uh, how to hip hinge properly, which is going to help you. Uh, deadlift properly with a barbell but uh and you know it's uh it's not about the tool so like there's tons of tools that you could choose from so it's not just kettlebells or or dumbbells or barbells or this or that um you know there's movements that you do for strength and then there's other exercises that you do to build the individual muscles that contribute to success in those movements so yeah is there anything if you want to write back, is there anything specific that you're looking to do and you want to know whether you should use kettlebells or dumbbells? That that question I can ask answer. Uh, oh, Money Watches, do you recommend plyometrics for men in our age group and is there a greater likelihood of injury? Um, yeah, as you get older, like our age, I mean, I'm 48 years old, so um, I don't think there is ever a point in your life where you should stop trying to be dynamic, but certainly as you get older, if you don't have a base of strength and you don't have uh, a base of, you know, moving properly and jumping properly and learning how to take off and land properly and everything, then yeah, as you get older, sure, there's an increased, increased risk of injury just simply because of age. But um, I would always incorporate some type of dynamic work because, you know, if you don't, just like anything, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you if you start too at too young of an age trying to play it safe because you're afraid to hurt yourself, that's almost a guarantee that you're going to hurt yourself because you're just you're you're you know you have to expose yourself to those to those types of exercises and those types of efforts in, in order to to maintain it. If you have a hope of maintaining it as you get older, yeah. Uh, Joe's got a good suggestion. Cutting down on beer in favor of uh, risk of whiskey. Need on the ice uh, for the last few months is health. To what is it like that? John seems. What was to that? Agree. This, is, this is apple juice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so okay so, you know um, the the gym, you know you have some restrictions on the gym, right? You know, and and there's a lot of restrictions on small business and whatnot going on in the last year, of course. You start picking up something else. You start doing something else now, right? Um, you start um, now. Is it, would you call yourself a day trader or not? A, that... Yeah, I don't even know what you would call it—a a, short-term yeah. investor, swing right. trader, right? Because I mean, I've I've done some like I've done some day trading. Mm -hmm. but day trading is different than you know. I I, I consider I guess myself more of a short-term investor or swing trader you know i might i'll hold a stock anywhere from you know a day to maybe several months i mean it really right. depends yeah so so how so 
have you had an experience doing this before? Is this something new? Yeah, um, how much time do we have? I have a whole <laughs> I have a whole story. <laughs> we got another about 20 minutes if you want to get into it a little bit, if you want to like, you know, condense I'll, it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'll try and condense it. So this is uh about the time when this is before Sam and I were married. Hmm. And I I think it was because of a coworker. I he was trading penny stocks. So I got involved in the whole penny stock thing. I remember that. And, uh, so long story short, without going into a long, boring story, I ended up sinking a lot of money into this stock. It was a pink sheet company. So mm -hmm. like, notorious for being manipulated, pump and dump schemes. I sunk, I sunk a bunch of money into uh, this mining company. I'll, I'll give the name too, because you might be able to look it up. CMKM Diamonds. The ticker symbol was CMKX. And this thing was trading at uh, triple zero one. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even near a penny. It was triple zero one. And I didn't know, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I invested a bunch of money in it. Anyway, however, on my honeymoon, I was in Mexico, did not readily have access to the internet other than through like um, the management office or something. This thing, moved the way I was hoping it would move, at least the beginnings of what I was hoping it was going to do. And it, in like literally like one day, it 10 times its value. Yeah. So I went from, you know, four mid four figure account to like a mid five figure. Like I almost had like a hundred grand that I could have, you know, made sold. For, I wouldn't have been able to sell for that, but like I right. 10 times my money. Yeah. And being like overly confident and not wanting to like spend all this time in front of the computer while my new wife was waiting for me to get off. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to let it go. This is just the beginning, man. This thing's supposed to go like whew, to the moon. Yeah. And of course it came right back down again and the stock was delisted. Yeah. They were under investigation. It was a pump and dump scheme yeah, yeah. and I lost a chunk of money. And since then I just felt, you know, just like guilt, shame, feeling stupid. How did I not see this coming? And I didn't go near the stock market for close to 20 years. Yeah. 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 It's like me, like with tequila. I got sick of it. I got sick on it in college. I went to the hospital and just the smell of it will make me sick. I can't even go near it. Uh. <laughs> um, Kevin has best watch to work out with. I, you got to go. You got to do G-Shock, right? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. You know, that's what I use when I yeah. work out. I've you worn know? it before, yeah. I, I I, very much like my Seiko Black Monster. I do. Yeah. I just, Or maybe it's just because it's a rubber strap. Just yeah. anything with a rubber strap has a little bit of give, but it stays tight to the wrist, and you just don't know that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, traditional dividend, long-term investor. Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm like that as well. You know, I like stocks that I know, um, you know, no, you know, on a daily basis, I could see around my house. I could see like, you know, uh, Procter and Gamble, you know, I can, I can see uh, J and J I can see uh, 3M, you know, um, but every once in a while I, I, uh, I get the urge to just like, you know, take a risk, you know what I Do mean? It. <laughs> and sometimes it works. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't, um, you know, but so anyway, so, so now this, you, so you get back into it, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and is there like a, um, a sector that they are, are you trading like medicals, like, uh, biotechs, like ice, or, or does it matter? Like, you know, what, 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 I mean, we're not giving financial advice here, right? Yeah, absolutely but, not. I, I'm the last person you should come to for financial advice. Right, right. But, but like, yeah, I, I what back. are you earmarking usually? Like, what could let's just talk sector wise. Sure. Let's keep so, I mean, that. obviously, there's a lot of different strategies and a lot of approaches you could take, but the one that seemed to resonate the most with me was uh, biotech stocks. Mm -hmm. right? So, companies that are going for uh, FDA approval mm -hmm. um, simply because there is a, uh, it's a big catalyst. It's a very important event for that company. It's it's on a schedule that everybody can see. They are widely talked about on YouTube and in the in the chat rooms. 
-hmm. in, I guess, depending on the research that you do, this is at least based on one research paper that I read that roughly 80% of drugs that get to that final stage get approved. Right. So it's a, it's a very high probability trade. And, um, and if anything, in most cases, it just even becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that everybody is expecting the price of this stock to appreciate leading up to its PDUFA date or its you know FDA approval date. So since everybody is expecting it to happen, everybody starts to buy in and that causes the price to rise and that, right. create, that attracts more investors and the price continues to rise. Okay. And that happens in most cases, not in all cases, obviously, there's always a risk. But uh, yeah, so I've, you know, that's, that's one of the strategies that I've been following and I've had a lot of success with it so far. So, so much so, well, success or not success, but your interest has, you know, peaked in, in, in this kind of venture that you've actually started a, a YouTube channel, right? I did. So what I did was the, uh, I had a YouTube channel that it really wasn't, I didn't, hadn't really put any effort into for years. It was for the old personal training business, but it already had like 300 some odd subscribers. So I repurposed that channel yeah. and I created stocks and stuff. So, yeah. and that is just solely focused on not giving advice, not trying to position myself as some type of expert because I am not, but just sharing my journey with people who care to listen about, you know, what I'm doing and how I'm learning and you know how I'm performing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like you know, it seems like financial channels, right, or channels that people kind of lay it out and say, "Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is not financial advice, but this is what I'm doing. Follow me. Follow me through the journey and see if I succeed or fail." Those channels do very, very well. And so, um, you know, your your subscriber base. I mean, you're. You you haven't been doing this uh, too long, and and you're almost you're almost getting to 500 subscribers, and and you'll probably pass me by the end of the year because I, I swear I mean financial channels just do just do so well, and and that is awesome. And I have a link to to John's channel um, in the description if you if you want to follow along. Um, crypto is a new wild west, man. This is so funny. Sure like, is. I, um, you know, last year I uh, I just decided that I I kind of like you know. I heard a couple of people, uh, people who knew what they were talking about, um, say that, you know, cri well, crypto is crazy, but you kind of maybe want to just have, you dip your toe in it a little bit and just no more than like 1% of your total portfolio should be in crypto. But, you know, you know, CV goes, hedge your bet that way. And I started, you know, even like 50 bucks a month, I was buying Bitcoin uh, through Coinbase, uh, the Coinbase app, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month. And, um, and then like, Mid last year, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? This is stupid. No, this is just stupid. Now, <laughs> now look at it. <laughs> and uh, then and then it just jumps up to like 50, yeah. 50 000 a, a coin like recently. You know what I mean? Like I I didn't have that much in the game. it wasn't like, you know, I was gonna, you know, quit my day job. I wasn't even close to anything like that, right? Yeah, right, right. But um so. but uh I just I, I just thought to myself, like, you know what, this is not part of the plan. My plan is is dividend investing, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. You know, every once in a while, you know, throw in money on in a Beyond Meat and do what really well at that, and then try to do that, replicate that with a couple other uh, companies, and then not do so well. That's what my my history is like one one win against like five losses, <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I should have known better, and then you know, right, right. Um, but uh, but this is great. So you so you've been doing you've been doing you've been fairly successful, right? In uh, not only just with your channel, but with your with your strategy mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you are thinking maybe down the road as a, you know, uh, as a, as a, an award to yourself or kind of like a, uh, an achievement, uh, present, you know, you're thinking Rolex possibly. Yeah. I, and that's not even necessarily because, you know, I'm a, I'm a complete newbie when it comes to watches, yeah. but as somebody who is just like on the periphery, Rolex is really just the one name that stands out to me that like if I were to get something that is, you know, recognizable, that that's the name, you know, yeah, of Rolex, course. you know, 
like if like you were saying like the tutor like beautiful watch beautiful watch it could you could tell me it's five times the quality of rolex and keeps time to like within a second you know plus or minus every day it would mean nothing to me because it doesn't have the name rolex right? right but it's like that's what's important to me is like just the whole like significance of saying like yeah i bought myself a rolex you know right well, well i think yeah, this, is, is this the value that you assign to it yeah absolutely and like look i mean like most of us who are here in the chat and, and myself included we're so geeked out on watches that we're we're mm -hmm. most of us are kind of beyond that i mean we still think you know, Rolex is a great Rolex is a great watch. Don't don't get me wrong, great name, and it does have a certain status uh, attached to it, right? Whether for better or for worse, right? Um, but uh, you know, we we're immersed in the hobby, and and we're such enthusiasts that we know about other there's other other things outside of Rolex, right? Sure, sure. But but for most people. For civilians, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like total civilian here. <laughs> who, are, who 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 don't know, you know, um, all the watches and all the types of movements that, that that we know, right? You know, Rolex is is a status symbol, and yeah. uh, and it's a symbol that you have made. I mean, there's reasons why, you know, back in the day, I don't know if companies still do that now, but like you know, if you achieve a certain amount of years in the company, you got a Rolex, you know, right. Domino's did that, you know what I mean? They would give like little Rolexes, they roll air Kings with a little Domino symbol on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but, uh, but there, but there is, there is an allure to it. And even if you've been collecting, there's still an allure to, to, to Rolex. I would say that if you, you had mentioned that you were, you know, possibly looking at pre-owned that, and if anybody has any suggestions in the chat for, for John, um, that you buy the seller, um, not the watch. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, make sure that, uh, um, you know, you, you, you go with a, somebody who's reputable, who has a really great reputation, um, in the, in the community. Um, because, um, there's a, there's a lot of fakes out there, you know, there's a yeah. lot of Rolex fakes. I'm concerned about. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I mean, all my watches, uh, Rolex Lifetime Achievement Award for many of us, man, for many of us who, you know, who are in the, in that, uh, in the hobby, but, um, you know, um, don't have the, the means to, to get high end watches. Like, you know, for me, the longest time I, like you, I, I wanted a Submariner. Actually, um, in 2007, I remember I, I, this, I, I was married before Mrs. Legs. I was, uh, and, uh, and I was getting married. And about a week before um, the wedding, I wanted to treat myself to a watch. And I went to go buy a Rolex, a Submariner. And I went to Tourneau in, in the Garden State Plaza. And the guy convinced me to buy a Tourneau watch because yeah. there was some crazy fancy dial that only one in 500. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> right? And, um, and so I almost regretted instantly buying that watch. Um, slightly, I regretted that slightly faster than, than the marriage. <laughs> um and so the watch is gone and the ex-wife is gone right um and so I, I had been chasing that rolex uh that's a mariner for a long time especially like in my head i've been i, I gotta get that back right so then, why why at this point buying all these other watches instead of just like one or two that you really really want well, all, all the ones that I'm, I'm, my collection at this point is getting to a point where I'm collecting watches that I really, really want. And there is life beyond Rolex for me now. I've discovered that. Okay. Right okay. Now. So it's just kind of Rolex has just kind of fallen to the wayside. Like it, it, it hasn't. So there's, it's a complicated, Rolex is complicated, right? Because like, if you want a new Rolex, it's almost impossible to get. It's almost impossible to walk into an ID. It's, all, it's impossible to walk into an ID and get a Submariner. You just can't do it now. I mean, you may get lucky. You may get lucky to one, in, you know, one, you know, and uh, you know, one in a million shot. Some people have gotten lucky, mm -hmm. but typically with some of these watches, especially the the sports models, Rolex, you have to have a purchase history with the AD beforehand. You know what I mean? Um, really? The, the the supply is not meeting the demand. Um, Do you think that's intentional? To drive I, don't, it, I don't know. To drive I, don't know. Price. I, th I think there's parts of the world now that are catching up economically that want Rolex, right? So okay. a lot of it might be going there. That that might be part of it. Um, 
Joe's saying the best advice I can give is find a reputable brick and mortar dealer on Chrono24 or eBay who has a decent price, then reach out to them directly and negotiate knowing that they'll save 10% um, direct sale. So that, that's another that's that's another way to, to handle it. But for me, you know, uh, I had it in my mind at the end of last year that I, I started selling watches off my collection because I wanted a, a day just. I really wanted also a uh, Submariner, but I would have taken either one, right? But I felt mm-hmm. like I had a better chance at a day just. And I went to a couple of dealers around me and there was just like nothing, nothing. Really? Nothing, not even the day just. I mean, I wanted probably the hottest day just, which is the blue dial. Fluted mm-hmm. bezel, yeah, um, yeah Jubilee bracelet, yeah, right. Um, but they, but they, you know, they didn't have any inventory, you know, <laughs> and um, and so that that was part of my decision to help me move forward. You know, I, there's so many other great watches. I I love German watches, and I'm starting to collect the watches that I that I really really like. You know, and um, so that's that's where I'm at. So I mean, I think um, Rolex is a great choice. Like somebody mentioned, a lifetime achievement award. I thought of it as that way too. I was yeah. uh, waiting till my fiftieth birthday to to maybe get one, but you know, if I don't, it's okay. Right. You know? And if you want one, that's okay too. You know, yeah. get it. You know. Um. Anyway, John, you know we're coming up to an hour. Um. Any last thoughts? Anything you want to plug? Um. I have all your links in the description. If anybody is interested in in, in checking out John's YouTube page, uh, stocks and stuff. And then some of his uh, literature that he's written about uh, fitness um, is also, there's also links in the description. Anything else you want to add, John? Um, no, nothing to plug really. But if, if you know, I, I do own a gym and uh, I do have a fair amount of experience with strength training and nutrition and stuff. So if anybody who's listening has any questions, you want to shoot me a message on YouTube, you know, feel free. I'm happy to answer questions and go back and forth with you and help you out. And uh, yeah, and if you want to give me a follow on the Stocks and Stuff YouTube channel and follow my journey, give me some encouragement, share your ideas with me, I would be uh, appreciative of that. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's fun. John walks through some of the the trades that he's thinking about uh, at the beginning of the week, some of that he's done. Um, so he, it's almost like, you know, pretty much full disclosure what he's doing, except for he just doesn't talk about how much he's trading, how much he's investing. And he just tells you what moves he's making. So it's a lot of fun to follow. I kind of, I love that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so please give him a follow and guys, um, I will be back on Sunday night of stream with, um, Sanjay from engineer wannabe doing, uh, the, uh, watch, uh, uh, watch soup uh, talking about topics uh, and then watch the world uh, this past week. So if you want to stop in at 9 p.m. on Sunday, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Bobby. Thank you. And have a, have a good night, everyone. Good night.